when people ask me, did you, did you survive, like, while your wife was gone? My kids were, like, asking mom. They're like, what are we going to eat when you're gone? And I was like, guys, did you forget what happened last year when mom was gone at this time? Right? You wanted McDonald's. You wanted Chick-fil-A. And you wanted Arby's. And we just made a train, man. We just went around and we got whatever we wanted to eat. So it was a, it was a fantastic weekend. My, my girls had so much fun. I, I, I read a book in the parking lot while they like roller skated and rode bikes. And we just, we just had an awesome time. And we, we, we started something new these last couple of weeks. We started giving them an allowance, right? Anybody get an allowance when they were growing up? right? Anybody still get an allowance, right? You know, <laughs> some in first service. So anyway, I remember like mom being like, okay, Tim, we're going to start giving you a dollar. We're going to give you a dollar a week and you have to, you have to keep your room clean every day to earn this dollar. And you know, as I grew up and that dollar for you know, cleaning my room, it, it, it moved to $2 because I got an added chore. I had to take out the trash. And so I was getting $2 a week for cleaning my room and taking out the trash. And then it moved up to $5 and I was cleaning my room and taking out the trash and mowing the lawn and, and shoveling the driveway. And then I remember just before I graduated, it got moved up uh, to $10. And, and I was, I became the dishwasher, right? Every night after we had meals, I was loading, or no, we didn't have a dishwasher at that point. Yeah, I was loading the sink and I was washing them by hand. And you know, the more chores that I did, the the more money that I would take in. And guys, I got to be honest with you, it wasn't about my parents not wanting to do chores or me earning money. It was about my parents wanting to teach me how to be a good steward, how to manage my finances. My mom even taught me this envelope system where like you label what you want on envelopes and you keep putting in that fund. And when that envelope is empty, you can't spend anything, right? It's gone. And so I had like one for savings and one for fun money and one for gas money. And I hid them in my dresser. I'd like pull out the drawer and stick them underneath in case, you know, anybody came in and tried to take my money. They, it was secure, right? It was like four knocks in there. And, uh, Anyway, I remember when she gave me that first dollar, she goes, Tim, I want to teach you something. When, when you receive a portion of that, you need to give back to God. When, when you get a dollar, that means you put a dime in the offering plate. God will bless you for it. When you get two dollars, you put two dimes in the offering plate. When you get Five dollars, you put fifty cents. When you put ten dollars, you put a dollar. When you put a hundred, when you get a hundred dollars, you put ten dollars, and so on and so forth. And she wanted me to understand the Old Testament uh, principle of tithing that we read in the book of Deuteronomy, a biblical principle we still encourage and practice today in the church as followers of Christ, because the church uses those funds to expand and grow the kingdom of God and to minister to those within it. We support missionaries and church planners and minister to families and children and teens in our community. And, and I'll never forget the words that, that she said to me when she gave me that first dollar. She said, if you give, God will bless you. And I thought, well, I want a big blessing from God. So that first Sunday, that whole dollar went in the offering plate. And I was excited. I was stoked. I went to bed with huge expectations and a big smile on my face. Because in the morning, I thought God worked like the tooth fairy. And I whipped over my pillow to look for the $2 I was expecting to get. And you know what I got? Nothing. I got, no, turns out God doesn't work like the tooth fairy. I was, I was let down. I had great faith in my expectations and my confidence. I had given everything, a whole dollar, and God let me down. He didn't come through like I thought he would. You know, my, my mom had read me Bible stories. I, I knew uh, about the widow and her oil in 2 Kings 
chapter 4 where, you know, there was a famine in the land and she was running out of money and running out of food and she had all these debts to pay. Here comes the prophet of God. He says, what you got? She's got a little oil. He says, well, go collect all these jars from your neighbors and then fill them up with a little bit of oil that you have. And God multiplies the oil. And it fills up all the jars. And, and then she sells them to pay her debts. And she keeps, the oil doesn't run out the whole time. The famines in the land. God multiplies. I, I remember reading the story or, or being told the story about Jesus and the disciples. And they go out fishing. And the disciples have been fishing all night long. And they come in and Jesus says, guys, 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 go back out and let your nets down on the other side. That's your problem. You got to let them out on the other side. And they catch so many fish that they got to call their buddies over. We can't get the nuts out of the water. And their buddies come over and they fill the boats up with so much fish that the boats begin to sink. God multiplies. God grows. God expands. I think about, you know, the story when Jesus is teaching the crowds and everybody's hungry and there's no, no place to get any food. And he's like, what do we have? And one of the disciples finds this little boy who's got, a, who's got a, you know, some loaves and, and some fish. And, and Jesus breaks these five loaves and two fish. And he feeds thousands of people. Right? He multiplies it. God, I'm going to give you all I have. And he multiplies it. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I gave him my whole dollar. He let me down. Came up short. My prayer was unanswered. The God who said to Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. He let me down. Do you know that, that feeling? Do you know the feeling of unmet expectations? Do you know the feeling of, of unanswered prayer? of no miraculous deliverance when it seems like God just leaves you hanging out to dry? Are you familiar with that? Because that's kind of how Jesus wraps up these core teachings that we've been looking at in Matthew chapter 5 that we've been studying over the last several weeks. That's the question we want to look at, what to do when it seems like God doesn't come through. I mean, just imagine sitting there on the hillside with, with the disciples, right? The, the crowds, you know, are, are kind of a little bit at a distance. And, and Jesus has called you over. And he's, he's given you the most intricate details of the kingdom of God. And on that mountainside, he's saying, he's saying, blessed are of the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And you're like, come on, Jesus. All oh, this is good stuff, right? He says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those with a single focus on my kingdom, for they'll see God. And you're like, bring it. Come on. Come on. And, and blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And you're like, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Keep it coming, Jesus. And although these are hard things that Jesus talks about, they at least seem somewhat doable, don't they? There's something inspiring about them, isn't there? With God's help, we can at least somewhat manage these things. There's an excitement. There's an anticipation. And then at the very end, he begins in verse 10. Happy. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are you, happy are you when, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you. Rejoice and be glad, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Nobody talking anymore. <laughs> but it gets real silent. Now, following Jesus takes on a whole new light. And we read in Matthew chapter 4 about this 
repentance thing about turning away from my sin and, and turning towards Jesus and, and following him in his ways and living God's life in his way. And we're all about that. We're all about the abundance of Jesus and the presence of Jesus in our lives. We can follow Jesus in this mission of changing the world and making a difference out there in other people's lives. We're all about that. But now we're going to be persecuted for it. Now we have to endure hardship. There's going to be times where we're let down, where our prayers aren't answered the way they thought they would be, when our expectations aren't met. Jesus, what are you talking about? We're going to have hardship. You guys, we're going to have hardship. Following me has a cost. I don't know if you know this or not. Not everybody likes Jesus. Not everybody is a fan of Jesus. And Jesus wanted his followers to understand that. He wanted them to know that they were signing up for and to be prepared for it. You know, we look at our world today, and according to churchinneed.org, more than 646 million followers of Jesus Christ live in countries where religious freedom is not respected. One out of every seven followers of Jesus suffers from a severe form of persecution. On an extreme end, 11 followers of Jesus are killed every single day. And if we're honest, we always picture persecution like that. Somewhere out there, far off, that is in the distance, that doesn't really affect our lives. But if we look at the text, Jesus uses the Greek word here, uh, dioko, which means so much more. Than, than what we often think. It, it means to harass, to make trouble for, to make flee, mistreatment and drive away. It can be done in, in ways like insults and slander and, and those kinds of actions. And it was much nearer to the early disciples and it's much nearer to us than we often perceive. In the early church, following Jesus could interfere with your business. If you watch news, you sometimes see stories about convictions people have as they follow Jesus, and it interferes with their business. It was the same for the early church. You couldn't belong to a trade guild because often that guild held meals that, that worshipped idols or false gods. In order to participate in the meal, you had to worship that same idol or false god. It could interfere with your social status. Often in the early church, you were treated without rights or, or as a second-class citizen in the, the community. You could be thrown into prison for not following in line with the, the religious or national hegemony. In some cases, for observing the Lord's Supper, followers of Jesus were accused of cannibalism because they were eating the body of Christ and they were, they were drinking His blood. And while we may not experience all forms of persecution right here, right now, we know it's a reality for many and something we all at least ought to be prepared to face. we got to be prepared. Because believe it or not, my friends, some of the things that we're talking about, that Jesus is talking about, uh, about slander and, and false accusations and a hostility, towards followers of Jesus, it's happening right now. Right here. It's not somewhere out there. It's right here in the United States, even though we're supposed to have religious freedom. In certain groups and environments, there is a hostility towards people who follow Jesus. So the question is, when we encounter that difficulty, like the disciples who are taken back on that hillside talking to Jesus, what do you mean we're going to be persecuted? The question is, how do we press on when things are tough? How do we press on when, when it feels like our prayers haven't been answered or like we've been hung out to dry? How do we press on when, when, when it seems like God hasn't come through? And if we go back to the text, we see that even though following Jesus results in difficulty and hardship and unmet expectations at some point in our lives and our relationships, we can press on in spite of the difficulty because of what God gives us. What is it that God gives us? Do you know? Blessed assurance, 
Jesus is born. He, he, he gives us assurance. Assurance of our citizenship in His kingdom. Suffering is a recognition that we are part of it. That's what we read in verse 10. It's a present identity or distinction that we belong to Him. We are His and He is ours. Verse 12 says, Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward. We just sang about it. Great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in the eternal dwelling place of God. This is what what Solomon, king of Israel, pictures in his poetic book in the Old Testament, Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3, when he says, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. See, friends, we're, we're, we're talking about, what we're talking about in the midst of tough times or hardship, the result of our following Christ and, and living in his righteousness and justice before him. As we read in verse 10, what we're talking about is twofold. Our suffering and hardship is both a present witness in the world in which we live and our hope in Jesus Christ, a declaration of the security and the hope that other people can have in Jesus, the fullness of his presence going with us through this life, leading us and guiding us in ways that lead us and others to experience the best this life has to offer. But then secondly, it bears witness to the reminder that this world isn't all there is more there's more to come that someday the sky is going to be ripped back and jesus is going to come in all his glory and he's going to reward those who have endured to the end with crowns and white robes and he's going to wipe away like we were singing about every tear from their eye and there will be no more death no more mourning no more crying or pain because it's proclaimed in revelation 21 the old order of things has passed way and so when when it gets hard when it gets difficult when following jesus doesn't result in what we've expected when we aren't delivered from that difficulty or don't receive the answer to prayer we desired we can still rejoice in our reward that's that's how we press on that's how we move through this difficulty we rejoice in our reward this is what we see happening in the early church when the apostles, referred to historically as the 12 closest followers of Jesus, they're together with the rest of the disciples and they're worshiping God and they're encouraging one another in Acts chapter 4 and verse 5. They're providing for each other. They're meeting needs for one another so that nobody has any need among them. And one day they're, they're in the temple courts. They're in that outer court and they're healing people. They're meeting people's needs. They're caring for them. They're serving them. Everybody, the impure, the ritually unclean, whoever came, they served, they ministered to, and they said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. They did it justly. They did it in the name of Jesus with kindness. And the religious leaders, they don't like Jesus. Jesus. And and so they they hear about in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, they they call these disciples before him. And then they're like, guys, we don't like Jesus. We don't like what you're doing. You can't be teaching in his name. Not in our house. You can't can't do that. Peter says, well, who who are we going to obey? Are we going to obey you? Are we going to obey God? So the religious leaders are like, well, we got to teach him a lesson. So they have them flogged. They, they whip them. And verse 41 says, the apostles leave the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. The name of Jesus. They were rejoicing in their reward, their testimony, and recognizing they're part of this kingdom. That's what their, their suffering spoke to them and spoke to others. They were Jesus. They belonged to his, and he was theirs. And yet in this face of persecution, we read that this church continued to grow, and it grew because people saw the power of, They saw the glory of God. They saw the curiously unexplainable joy of these men who endured hardship. 
the, the question I think about is what do people see? What do they observe in us during our times of hardship? When we go through difficulties, when God doesn't show up in our lives the way we expected, when we have unmet expectations, what do people view in our lives, how we respond? Are we apt to complain? I know sometimes I struggle with that. Do we become angry with our circumstances or frustrated with those who have maybe treated us less than? Does our attitude change? Are there times we maybe doubt God or are tempted to throw in the towel and give up? Because let me tell you, friends, how we endure hardship, how we endure persecution, how we endure slander, even sometimes at the hands of other well-meaning believers, evidences our faith and trust and belonging to Jesus Christ. And that speaks to a watching world. That speaks to a watching world. It's inspiring to a watching world. And when we begin to see difficulty as an opportunity to elevate Christ, instead of running, instead of hiding with confidence and courage, We'll press on. Look at, look at verse 11. Verse 11 is so key in understanding how we, how, we, how we do this, how we work through difficulty, how we work through hardship. It's not only that we rejoice in our war, reward, but here it says overcoming hardship and difficulties. We, we do this. Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say, all kinds of evil against you, get this, because of me. Because of me. That's, that's the key phrase we need to focus on. We don't rejoice in suffering. Je Jesus doesn't call us to go out looking for suffering. We don't wake up in the morning with the mindset of, gee, how can I really screw my life up today? Right? We, don't, we don't get up and, and, and look for suffering we don't pray or hope for persecution, but the encouragement is we be prepared for it. Not to seek it out, but to be prepared for it. Be prepared for hardship. Be prepared for difficulty. Because if we follow Jesus, and I guess even if we don't follow Jesus, this is the reality John tells us in verse 16, uh, or chapter 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have trouble. Right? doesn't matter if you follow Jesus or not. Now, this is speaking specifically to Jesus' followers. But I got to thinking about that, and you know, that's true whether you follow Jesus or not. In this world, you will have trouble. The point being, we're not blessed because we suffer. We're blessed for why we suffer. Why we suffer, specifically when we suffer for Jesus. Because the natural result of sin or selfishness is suffering, is hardship. It does lead to difficulty. Death, as Scripture says, sin and suffering are the result of living in a broken and fallen world. So we press on and we endure not by focusing on our suffering and our hardship, but by focusing on Jesus. We can press on when we focus on Jesus. Any, any runners here? This, this may be a little bit Embarrassing. Oh my goodness, Strider. This is this is hard when I think of you. The, the furthest and farthest I've ever run is four, maybe five miles. Right? Four, yeah, right? Four, four, maybe five miles. I know some of y'all have me beat. My wrestling coach, he had us conditioning for wrestling, and so he would have us run these routes up hills through neighborhoods along the creek back by the coal burning bc cop power plant you know not like our clean nuclear facility here in upstate oconee county and let me tell you how i ran it 
how I made it that far. It wasn't by thinking my legs hurt, my legs hurt, my legs hurt, my legs hurt. Right? It wasn't by thinking, I can't do this. This is too hard. It wasn't by thinking, there's a cramp in my side. I just want to stop for a minute. It wasn't by thinking, oh, my friends have left me. They're way up on ahead, and I'm not even close to them. It, it, it wasn't by, by thinking, I've got so far to go, and I'm so tired. No, that's not how I kept going. I kept going by thinking about the goal. One more step. One more step. One more step. Keep going. Almost there. Three more turns. Two more turns. I can see somebody. It's the home stretch. I can see the finish line. I kept the goal in mind. Think of the... the the writer in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fix our eyes on Jesus. I like that. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And you know why I like that? Because Jesus models and he shows us how to go through difficult times, how to endure hardship. The text here says he loved us so much that with joy he endured the cross. He bore its shame and then he received his reward. That's what we got to remember. That's, that's what we look at. He sat down at the right hand of God. God raised him to new life, which set the example for us, according to Romans 8, that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in us, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in us. He shows us the result of enduring and going through difficulty, of pressing on. Commentator William Barclay says, this word results from two Greek words, which mean to leap Exceedingly. Let me demonstrate. Right? You ever do that when your team wins the game? You ever do that when you finish the race? When you win the game? When you make the A? When you get the raise? When you get the position? It's the joy which leaps for joy. The joy that can't be contained. He describes it like the climber who's reached the top of the summit. They've been working so hard and, and straining and they're tired and they've made it up the mountain. It was hard. It was difficult, but you overcame. You know who else overcame? Who overcomes? Who conquered mountains? Jesus. Jesus. So when we go through hardship and difficulties, and things don't turn out the way we want them to. That's where we focus. We focus on Jesus. We model Jesus all throughout his life when Jesus faced trials and struggles. What did he do? Remember, remember what he did? He prayed. Right? He withdrew early in the morning to the mountainside, to quiet places. He prayed, and often his prayer was accompanied by fasting. Fasting, not looking in the things of the earthly world for, for satisfaction and, and, and meaning, but turning to God for fulfillment and reaching out to him and saying, God, I'm so empty. I need you. Would you, would you fill me? That's what fasting is. That's what it means. Think of the Psalms. Psalm 1 specifically. How that speaks to me that, that when our roots 
are in Jesus, we grow firm and strong and bear fruit. We're not like the, the chaff from a fire that is blown and tossed about by the wind. That's what Jesus, Jesus calls us to be like. To press on in spite of the, of the difficulty. If you're experiencing difficulty in your life right now, let me encourage you, look to Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Model Jesus. And you can be confident that if things don't turn around in this life, that they will in the next. And they will witness and speak to others in the midst of their difficulty. Which brings me to verse 12. We're almost done here. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There's this guy in the Bible named Elijah. Remember Elijah? If you don't know about Elijah, go to the book of 1 Kings and, and look in chapter 18. You don't know where 1 Kings is? Look in your index in, in the Bible. I'll show you where it is. Elijah is one of my favorite stories. He's a prophet who stood up to the, the queen Jezebel at that time and, and the prophets of Baal when she was leading Israel astray into bad acts of worship and, and, and false gods. And, and I, I, I love this story. It's like the big showdown. Elijah has had enough and says, okay, Jezebel, gather up all your prophets of Baal and we're going to see what's up. You Build your altar and put a sacrifice on it. I'll build my altar over here. And the God who answers by fire is the true God. So Jezebel gets her prophets and she, she sets up this, this altar and, and she's got the sacrifice on it. And, and from morning to noon, they begin to dance around this altar, trying to get their God's attention and, and crying out to him. And they're just, oh! Bill, 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 come and answer us by fire. And they begin to take knives and cut themselves. Anything they can do to get their God's attention. Not like what we read about Elijah. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe you need to shout louder. I, I don't, maybe he's not quite paying, paying attention. And he begins to kind of mock him a little. And about noon he says, okay, guys. It's my turn, but just before, hang on a minute. He has a three-foot trench dug around his altar. Then he gets buckets of water and begins to pour them on top until that three-foot trench is filled. I'm not a Boy Scout, but if you're going for fire, I don't think this is the way you do it. And he begins to pray. Yeah, I mean, it's not ours. He begins to pray this simple prayer, Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And the Lord sends fire from heaven. Now, when I read that, I don't think of this like little tiny spark that maybe blew over from the next town over and just happened to land on the sacrifice. I think of a, a lightning bolt. I think of a, a fireball whooshing down from the sky. Because it, it burns up the sacrifice. It consumes the wood. The stone is gone. And it licks up all the water in the trench. <laughs> Let's go! You know what Elijah does? He runs away. He runs away. He flees. He's driven away. He heads out to the wilderness. He's been hiding in caves and drinking from streams. He's tired. He says, God, I can't do it anymore. Just imagine Elijah, right? He's, he's just won this huge showdown. He's an incredible man of God. He's done all these miraculous acts. And even he experiences hardship. Even he gets tired. And yet in the midst of it all, he stays faithful. Now look at the New Testament. 
And when John the Baptist comes before Jesus preaching the kingdom of God, who is he compared to? Elijah. He's got the spirit and power of Elijah on him. We got all these prophets in the Old Testament, many of them who endured persecution and difficulty, harassed and treated with hostility. And here comes John the Baptist, who's persecuted too, mind you. He's thrown in prison. He's even beheaded. But he comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah here and points people to the Messiah, the ultimate prophet God, Jesus. My my point being is that often our suffering, our enduring hardship for the kingdom, our mistreatment, our staying faithful anyway, encourages someone else to do the same. Makes things a little bit easier for the person following after us. That's why we remember those who have gone before us. So we can have that mindset, that motivation, that that not only is the world watching us in our hardship, but we're also paving the way for someone else. It's going to be inspiring for them. It's going to be a little bit easier for them. I mean, how many times do we see the prophets quoted or referred to in the New Testament? Their lives and actions are still impacting the people who come after them. We go back to Hebrews 12, 1, makes this very clear. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, people who have gone before us, people who are cheering us on, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run the race with perseverance marked out for us. In the hardship, we can keep going when we feel like we've been hung out to dry. When it feels like our prayers haven't been answered. When, when we been, feel like we've been treated as less than. We can press on inspired by those who have gone before us. The prophets of old. The women and men of old. Knowing that we in turn are going to be that inspiration for someone else. Maybe our children. Maybe our grandchildren. Maybe our neighbors or our, our classmates. Some of the people that are struggling here today. My friends, the prophets left us a legacy. That's that's what Jesus reminds us of. And their legacy encourages us to keep going, to press on, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of hardship. If they left that kind of legacy for us, What kind of legacy are we leaving for those coming after us? If the prophets did that for us, what are we doing for others who are coming after us? Are we going to be known as, as, you know, people who were poor in spirit? Who said, I need God so bad in my life. I want him more than anything else. I can't go on without him. Who realize our inability to do anything for ourselves and we need God. Are we going to be the type of people who are grieved at the brokenness that exists in our world and who cry out, this is not right. Lord, save us. When people think about us, are they going to think about us as meek? Are they going to think about us as humble, as someone who is gracious and often treated others better than they deserved? Who would be known as someone who loved mercy? And sought to bring about the peace of God in all of life's difficult situations. Will we be thought of as people who did and do hard things? Pressed on and endured even in the face of difficulty. Like the prophets who have gone on before us. How will we encourage those who are coming up after to keep going? our words, through our actions, through our attitudes, those things that Jesus calls us that are most dear to him. I want to, I want to wrap up this morning, really, I want to wrap up this series by asking, are you experiencing the blessed life that Jesus is talking about? Right now, 
Are, are you experiencing the kingdom life that Jesus talks about in your relationships, in your home, in this community of believers, in, in, in your community where you work, where you live, where you go to school? Are you experiencing the kingdom? Are we living out these core teachings of Jesus? Are we committed? Because this is what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to build his kingdom, to bless every single person that we come into contact with. I mean, it's in the very next few verses following these kingdom teachings. Jesus says to those who he's just shared with, Right? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And if that's true, then these are the teachings that we've got to aspire to. That we've got to live out. So here's what I'm asking. I'm asking each of us with the Lord's help to strive to be these kinds of people. To strive to be kingdom people, no matter what we face. You know, often, often in life, we like to take the easy way. Jesus didn't call us to take the easy way. He called us to do hard things. So others will know and experience the same hope in Jesus that we have. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask you to pray. If you want to come up front, you can come up front. If you want to sit in your seat, you can sit in your feet. The important thing is respond to the Holy Spirit's nudging in your life. Father God, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for your word, which is living and active and still relevant for us today. And Lord, I don't know where everybody's at. I don't know what's going on, whether we're facing hardships, whether we have unmet expectations, whether someone has hurt us intentionally or unintentionally, God, Whatever our situation where we are experiencing difficulty, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would help us be like Jesus. I pray that you would help us focus on Jesus and look to him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And where we have fallen short, God, we cry out to you and we say, help. Help, give us the courage to make it right. Give us the courage to bless others in spite of where we have failed. Give us the courage to keep going. Because it's not just about us. It's about every person that we come into contact with. You died for them, Jesus. You love them. So I'm asking you to help us by your Holy Spirit to live out these kingdom values. Convict our hearts, God. 